This is lecture five. Uh, we're going to be in prehistory here uh, for a couple of lectures. I call this one early man. Um, uh, let's talk about African origins here for a moment. Uh, our ape-like ancestors uh, ventured onto the savannas of East Africa about four million years ago. Uh, these early uh, hominids uh, quite often acted as scavengers in their search for food, uh, along with the hyenas and the vultures and other creatures. Um, these early hominids were also prey uh, for big cats and other predators. Uh, we should stress bipedalism. This is a, a key uh, evolutionary development where man begins to stand upright and walk on two legs as opposed to monkeys and gorillas who, who still move about quite often on four limbs. Bipedalism allows man to uh, sort of rise above his environment a bit and can see further uh, can see both danger and opportunity. Uh, early man uh, develops what we'd call stereo vision. This allows for depth perception. This allows us to calculate just how far we should throw that rock or that spear to kill uh, dinner, uh, which is just further along the grass there. So stereo vision, bipedalism, these are key evolutionary developments. Uh, early man substituted sticks and stones for teeth. Uh, this, of course, puts distance between the hunter and the prey. Uh, early man domesticated fire. Uh, from this we get heat, obviously, in the, uh, to protect us against the cold, uh, protection, uh, light. Uh, uh, we can cook food, make it easier to digest with fire. Early man, if, if you'll notice, uh, unlike other primates, early man's larynx is further down in his throat here. You see it here in the middle of the throat. Uh, this allows for sort of an unencumbered voice box, which aids us in the development of language. And of course, language allows for agreed upon meanings among human beings. Uh, this is a key development. Uh, language allows for coordination of behavior. Uh, once we decide what to call things and what they mean, uh, I should stress that human adaptability transcends ordinary environmental limits. There are no places on earth that we have not ventured to and usually thrive in. Um, human language and migration would eventually impact local ecosystems everywhere on this planet. Uh, a few words about human migration. In both Australia and in the Americas, the arrival of humans, human hunters especially, uh, coincided with the widespread die-off of large animals. Uh, horses and camels, for instance, uh, disappeared from the Western Hemisphere when humans arrived. Large mammals in the Western Hemisphere had not had the time to perceive the danger posed by humans uh, because we had only recently arrived. Technologies and languages spread with migrations and large animals disappeared with human migrations. Now, I want to take a moment and talk about what I call opaque documents. Uh, this is a metaphor, opaque meaning murky or something you can't see through. Uh, we think of modern historians as working in the archives with actual paper documents. Uh, here, we're talking about opaque documents, things from the deep past that we don't understand necessarily, but being a curious animal, we tend to speculate about their meaning. Uh, for instance, somewhere around 50,000 years ago, human beings began to bury the dead. Uh, previously, they had left the dead on the trail and simply kept moving. Uh, why? Why did we begin to bury the dead? Uh, we find preserved corpses uh, with red ochre smeared over their skin. Uh, ochre is, uh, is a red a mineral similar to this Georgia red clay that you're all used to. Uh, why is this red, uh, this red dye put on the bodies? Is, is red symbolic of blood, which is uh, symbolic of life? We find corpses buried facing east quite often. Is this because the sun rises in the east? Um, we find uh, grave sites with tools, uh, with fertility goddesses, with weapons uh, buried alongside the corpses. Uh, the question, of course, is why? 
uh, are these implements to be used in an afterlife? We begin to see a theme here of life, death, and rebirth. Uh, experts in the spirit world differentiated themselves from ordinary people on the strength of their ritual roles and their unusual capacity to summon the supernatural. Again, rise of religion, rise of a priesthood. Uh, take a look at the Chinese terracotta army here. This is quite remarkable. Uh, thousands of figures individually carved and the faces are all distinct. They're not cookie cutter. You see horses and chariots and uh, this is a remarkable effort. It took a, a great deal of coordination and authority to do something like this. Uh, the key question, of course, is why? Why would the Chinese emperor demand this sort of uh, following into the afterlife? Or at least a hint that he believes that he will use this army in an afterlife. Of course, we see the ziggurats. You see these in ancient Sumer, these pyramidal-like structures, these temples that are reaching to the heavens. Uh, we see them in Central America. You've all seen the pyramids along the Nile in Egypt. Um, cave paintings. Uh, these images are, are fantastic. Uh, we, see, we find them deep in caves. We find them high up on uh, cave walls, uh, high enough so that these artists would have had to build scaffolding to reach that height. Uh, there would have had to have been plenty of light in there for them to see what they were doing. Um, the historian has to ask the question, why? Why did these people do this? It was just this, just a simple aesthetic nature uh, expressing itself. Uh, were they paying homage to the animal in hope that he would return so we could continue to eat and feed our children? Uh, are these paintings of these animal herds, uh, is it part of a, an initiation rite uh, for young men? We don't know. That's why we call them opaque documents. It's unclear. But certainly there is a theme here that emerges of life, death, and rebirth. Now with that in mind, I'm going to take a couple of moments and talk about origin myths. Uh, origin myths are common all over the world and there are some remarkable similarities as you move from civilization to civilization. Uh, common themes across human societies uh, to account for our presence here on earth, to explain our purpose to answer the question of evil, uh, to account for the origin of things. Uh, common questions that origin myths try to answer, how do we get here? How was the earth created? What happens when people die? A common agent in origin myths, other than animals that can do things that we don't, uh, that animals don't do, uh, are supernatural powers, gods, deities of some variety of, or, other, or the other. Um, Origin myths attempt to translate the unknown into the known, the unfamiliar into something more familiar. Uh, humans project their own qualities onto gods, endowing objects and the forces of nature with human traits. Uh, humans tend to anthropomorphize gods or to make deities manlike. Uh, a good example, one you're, most of you are probably familiar with, is the Hebrew god of the Old Testament, Yahweh. Uh, this is the God you guys just simply refer to as God. Uh, this is a very personal God. He walks in the garden. He gets angry. He's wrathful, vengeful, uh, even murderous at times. Think of Noah's flood. Uh, he's very jealous. Uh, he's a warrior God. He, he appears to have a, a chosen people whom he favors against everyone else. Uh, he has contracts with his chosen people, the Israelites. Uh, they call them covenants in the Bible. Uh, Yahweh's preoccupied with reproduction. Uh, he has all these human qualities uh, that we project on him. So this, uh, this is a very common uh, theme or motif in these origin myths. I'll mention a few others. Uh, mythical animals uh, associated with man. Uh, here are the most obvious examples, the serpent. Uh, we find the serpent in both the Epic of Gilgamesh and of course, we have a talking serpent in, uh, in Genesis, in the Bible. Uh, another common theme is a mythical language, uh, a common belief that a single unifying language existed in the deep past. 
But then something happened to scatter people into different groups, different languages. Here again, the most obvious, obvious example is from Genesis with the Tower of Babel. Uh, you'll remember that a uh, man was building this tower uh, to the heavens, got too close to God, and God scattered them and confused their tongue so that they couldn't communicate. Uh, we see the Tower of Babel as a, a ziggurat, one of the Sumerian ziggurats, the priestly temples rising to the heavens. Um, another uh, common motif is a sort of mythical paradise somewhere back in deep uh, primitive time, sort of a, a golden age when life was easy and peaceful, no one died, food was plentiful. But then something goes wrong and misfortune and grief come to man. Uh, again, the obvious example is from our own origin myths. In Genesis we have uh, the fall of man, original sin, uh, that destroys this uh, earthly paradise. Then of course we have mythical fire. The uh, first fire presumably was uh, began to be domesticated uh, as lightning struck the savannas of East Africa, I would suppose. Uh, we have myths to account for this, of course. Prometheus uh, in the Greek mythology brought fire to humans and then of course was eternally punished uh, for this transgression. So these are some common themes, common motifs that we find in origin myths. Conclusions here. Uh, myths are not lies. They are explanations. Uh, so don't discount myth. You'd be surprised at uh, the power of these myths and how they still influence us today. Myths are usually rendered metaphorically, not literally. And here we get into trouble when we read texts that are written and uh, to be understood metaphorically and we try to impose a literal meaning on them. Uh, and we'll talk about this more as we go forward. Myths tend to glorify the past and they justify the present. And finally, myths explain cosmology or our place in the universe. So I'll end there. Thank you.